I'd like us to start looking into, so what is the reason um, for Islam prohibiting and putting restrictions on the Muslim woman marrying people of the book? Okay, like we said earlier, it is not uh, very categorical from text. But of course, majority of scholars inferred and understood the verse to mean it is not permissible because Quran is silent where he mentioned permissible for this and gay condition, but he didn't say a chaste woman, you know. But then, from the wisdom of scholars and what we can see in reality and from the text, other texts other than Quran and Sunnah, number one, you see, in marriage, most of the complaints, like over 80 percent, come from women. We talk of single parents. So that's like complaints, those cases that go Marital to court. Marital complaints, of yeah. course, mm. are initiated by women. Mm. When you talk of single parenting, you're talking entirely, in most cases, 90 percent instances of women. So they are more at the receiving end. And uh, because the man has more authority in the marriage, Islam is concerned with who guarantees her rights. Okay? Islam already has it enshrined that if a Muslim man marry a kitabia, a chaste woman from the people of the book, he does not have the right to force her, to coerce her to become a Muslim. And the freedom of her religion is guaranteed. But reverse is the case. If a Muslim woman is married to a Jew or Christian, the freedom of her religion is not guaranteed. Similarly, the rights of wife that Islam obliged a man to fulfill is not binding on a kitabi because he's not a Muslim. He's not bound by the rulings of Islam. Okay, what if we have cases that a Muslim woman has to go to court to defend her rights? as provided in Quran and Sharia generally. The Muslim man may choose not to because he's not bound by it. Mm. So these are some of the wisdom and a number of other instances we're going to see the likely challenges that might follow, which it is easier to say it is the Muslim man marrying a Jewish woman or Christian woman because Islam already has in its own text that mm. fold, that space for them and that they can be. But when we reverse it, it is nearly impossible. So these are some of the wisdom. And so what, when we look at, um, uh, as you said, when it comes to who's the victim uh, in most uh, cases of divorce, um, usually it's the women who are on the receiving yes. end, and that if any needs legal protection, it's usually more the woman that needs the legal protection, yeah. uh, not so much the man. Yeah. Consequently, if a Muslim woman is going to marry a non-Muslim man, it's difficult for Sharia to give her the legal protection because it cannot call the non-Muslim man uh, on issues to do with personal law. Um, if yeah. he is requiring her to do something, Islam can't tell him you can't. Her you know. rights are not guaranteed. So, fine, I get that one. The other area that I want us to look at, uh, just ar around the same area, um, is there anything else? Because you did say that there is no explicit reason given in the Quran why it prohibits this or, you know, uh, allows that or restricts women in areas, but it didn't restrict men. But looking at, you know, reality of society, scholars are coming up with what's the wisdom. I guess it's like the Quran saying no eating of pork. Uh, no giving reasons, but people start looking into what could be the wisdom behind this. Not doubting it, but just looking for the wisdom. Sister Salah, what would you add here? Um, I think when we look at this, what I would add is that in as much as we have um, forms of interfaith marriages that are permissible, we still see scholars discouraging it. And they give certain reasons, which helps us understand what they see as the benefit of you know, same faith marriages. For instance, one um, issue that is mentioned is that there is that partnership 
the spiritual intimacy that one would expect between a husband and a wife. And this cannot be achieved where their religious beliefs are not in tune with um, each other's and where there is no, um, no foretelling where you would say, oh, we, she just or he just needs to read the Quran a bit more, he'll understand better. But we are talking about a completely different set of beliefs and so on. We also would um, not, it, we would not do justice to this topic without mentioning that this restriction on interfaith marriages isn't something that is just found only within Islam, but you find the same thing among people of other faiths as well. And sometimes Christians would cite from um, the Bible itself that, you know, there's a particular um, verse in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians um, 6, 14, where they would mention that the, um, the believer should not be unequally yoked with an unbeliever, which I think even casts my mind back to the conversations we had earlier, that from the point of view of people of other faiths, we are the unbelievers. And when we are called this, sometimes we almost think, no, I am a believer, I have my beliefs as well. But here in this verse, though the focus is on um, marriage, that right there and then we find there are restrictions as well within certain sects or denominations of other faiths. So the whole concept of saying people should, a husband and a wife should share the same religious identity or belief is because of the concern that, you know, the... Um, spiritual support that a person gets from the spouse would be absent. Things like praying together, if one looks at the Muslim faith, fasting together in the month of Ramadan, going on Hajj together, praying together, listening to Quranic recitation together, or doing Athkar together, these things aren't there. If the um, one of the parties is maybe a Christian, they would want to go to, for church service on Sundays. They are depending on the denomination, they have times when they go for church programs and services. And the other spouse who is not a Christian may not be able to appreciate that. So you have immediately a gap in their spiritual lives. There's also the concern for the preservation of Islamic values and the Islamic faith and passing on the Islamic legacy. Because from the point of view of Muslims, Islam is the culmination of every revelation before then. So for a Muslim, anything that does not fully embrace the Islamic message would always feel as if there's a gap somewhere. The mm. message is no longer complete. Mm. So there's the concern for making sure the complete message, as we understand it coming from God, is preserved and passed on from generation to generation. Now, we can look at it. So, so, far, so far, I've been talking more about the spiritual side. We can look at the more, what you might call, practical, real life, everyday thing that we see. The fact that when one looks at um, the studies and research, um, what it has shown so far, what's the impact of having different religious beliefs on a marriage, the result is not actually encouraging. The fact is that there is likely to be a higher rate of divorce or separation in interfaith marriages compared to same faith marriages and the reasons are um, many but some of the reasons are the same things i cited earlier lack of spiritual support gap in that understanding and the fact that for a person to retain their faith their beliefs very often there's a function a role played by the um, religious community so if someone is not a part of the same religious community as the spouse it also means they are um, close confidence, their social support systems would have places where they are fractured and disconnected. A survey carried out around 2001 um, where about 35,000 people were interviewed. And these are people in interfaith marriages to find out what is the state of their marriages. It was found out that they are three times more likely to end up divorced or separated and the actual weight in that case is the difference in religion. This is a study that is accessible. The result of this study is accessible to anyone. They just have to check for um, the title, Till Faith Do Us Part, How Interfaith Marriage is Transforming America, Oxford University Press um, publication. So these are some of the considerations that go into this issue. This is... Uh 
an interesting and disturbing statistic yeah. um, where in societies that are actually, you know, already with high divorce rates are of around 40% uh, percent according to more recent surveys, um, the divorce rates of interfaith marriages are three times higher than those of normal marriages. Um, normal marriages are already struggling, yeah. um, so you're actually multiplying uh, these divorce rates, yeah, complications. Um, and this would apply whether it's the man marrying the non-Muslim woman or vice versa. Yeah. Um, but I think these just add to the reasons why many scholars try to discourage, many parents try to discourage, anybody who has studied what goes on uh, tries to discourage. So even though it is permissible, you did have Sahaba, Uthman bin Affan, who married uh, Ahl al-Kitab, uh, Abdurrahman bin Auf married Ahl al-Kitab, Omar tried to discourage some of this. Um, but what we are finding is now huge surveys of, you know, uh, 30,000 uh, and above people and coming with this statistic that I think people need to take uh, more okay. seriously. Um, going forward, but you've already touched on the bigger legal challenges that scholars give, why there would still be a greater clampdown, if I use that term, of uh, Muslim women marrying uh, outside the faith compared to men, this whole issue of who's most likely going to be the victim in uh, yeah. this type of case. So more like a Saddu Zaria uh, principle there. However, Sister Salah, when it comes to interfaith marriages, as much as we may mention these are some of the dangers, etc., some people would still want to go ahead for whatever reason. What other reasons are there? Why do these interfaith marriages have greater problems with them? Uh, but also I'd like to ask, what advice would both of you give when it comes to uh, Muslims, uh, scholars, counselors, um, parents, friends, when they see interfaith marriages unfolding? Uh, what would you say here? Yeah, um, thank you. I think this question on this topic is important because of the increasing number of people who go into um, interfaith, intertribal, interracial marriages. With the increase in movement between one country and another, globalization, there is greater chance that um, there are greater opportunities for people to meet others and to even move from their home countries to other countries. So you have Muslims moving from Muslim majority countries to and Muslim minority countries. When you have that going on, then the chance or the likelihood of a Muslim meeting uh, um, another Muslim that they consider suitable for marriage, that they like, who likes them in return, just, you know, the likelihood just drops because they are now in, a, in an environment where many of the people they are coming across are not even Muslims to begin with. That is the reality of what we are facing. But that doesn't change the fact that the challenges remain. As I've mentioned, studies show this, data shows that there are challenges. And ultimately, you end up with such interfaith marriages being more unstable, less happy than interfaith marriages. One isn't saying that, um, than, sorry, safe, same faith marriages. One isn't saying that same faith marriages don't have challenges, but the challenges are made more complex, the dynamic much more complicated when you throw into the mix of the other differences of upbringing and personalities and views. You throw into that mix difference in religious beliefs. When we look at interfaith marriages, some of the issues that arise that people going into interfaith marriages face and will have to deal with would include things like the conflict in religious identity. Um, religious beliefs are um, a core part of people's lives and they affect so many aspects of life that it's very hard to have difference in religious beliefs and yet be able to forge a close intimate relationship. So when it comes even to the question of the identity, there is a conflict right there and then. When we look at religious dress, religious um, practices or routines or symbolisms or religious ideals or standards of values. These differences 
permeates so many aspects of a couple's life that it strains the relationship when they are actually opposed to each other. For example, we take something, a concept like polygamy, which in Islam is considered to be permissible, even though many would say they would rather not have it, but nobody says it's haram. Nobody frowns and says this is a strange thing. But if you then look at the Christian perspective, what's the Christian belief about polygamy? In many cases, they would actually say this is a sin. And so you have two things that are really opposed to each other. Or we take diet, nutrition, what's permitted, what's not. For the Muslim, alcohol is a big no-no, capital letters bold underlined. But for Christians, you have varying views. Many would not say it's forbidden. They might say it's discouraged, they might talk about drink responsibly, or drink a little, or not hard um, alcohol. They have these nuances, but they do not say it is forbidden. So a Christian having alcoholic drinks in the refrigerator, at the dining table, is not, it's not a sin. But for a Muslim, it's like, don't even bring it into my house. So you have these things that can't be ignored. Um, if we look at the festivals, the same thing occurs. The routines, the rites, the same thing. You find that as um, one of the areas of conflict. Another area is when these differences show up in how we choose to eat, who we associate with, what we consider to be okay or not okay, in order to, to maintain the relationship, in order to make room for the other in his life or her life, the individual then tries to de-emphasize his or her religious identity or practices. Sometimes they both do the same in the interest of peace, to the extent that they stop practicing their religious faith and they do only the barest minimum. So some lose their faith altogether. Then you might find along the line some major life-shifting event, like the death of a loved one, the birth of a child, or debilitating illness, or just the advancement in age, when the individual starts to really fo um, you know, focus on some existential issues. What happens when I die? Where do I go? Um, this has happened. What do I lean on? Where they want some higher authority or higher being, and they turn towards their concept of God, who he is. Then they reassert their original faith, and sometimes that is exactly what causes the big rift. Because the spouse says, but this isn't what we agreed upon. This isn't how we started. What is Because this? for many, religion is their coping mechanism. Yes, it's, so when they, fall they back get on hit it. Yes, by they fall a on challenge or trauma. Mm -hmm. And it causes a rift. Even where the couple are of the same faith and one person becomes very conscious of religion, it causes a rift. Let alone where the other person says, this is even foreign. So you have that. Another challenge they face is sometimes when love is high and they are drunk on all the hormones of being in love they feel love will conquer everything at that point when the hormonal levels come down vasopressin oxytocin and normal life resumes usually sometimes this happens even inside a year sometimes after some years then they start to realize that religion does matter to me or to us it's no longer to be ignored Unfortunately, they failed at the point where they were negotiating their marriage, where they were going into courtship to discuss the religious aspects, especially where it comes to, so what is our life going to look like two years from now, five years from now, 10 years from now, in a practical sense. In some cases, they are not able to have those conversations because they can't imagine it. They can't visualize what does this religious difference mean in very practical and real terms? Uh, lastly, we look at the fact that if um, one spouse, or the, it's an interfaith marriage, the community or the family of the other spouse might, and in many cases do, have trouble accepting this other person because the person is believed to be, um, you know, not part of the in-group a foreigner, an alien, coming with your alien ideas. Let's imagine it's a Muslim woman and she's dressed the way I'm dressed. Some consider that to be too much. And they might start uh, uh, making comments like, are you not hot? Why do you have to dress like this? Are you going to go to hellfire? Which the woman would find offensive 
annoying and might even say, you know, they are speaking to me in a condescending way. Or the woman is not a Muslim and she dresses as she believes she's free to dress because she doesn't have um, a scripture saying cover this or cover that. And then people start making comments, why would you dress like this? You know, you're a married woman now and so on and so forth. She would have the same reaction and the same feelings. So these are some of the issues that come up that people in interfaith marriages have to cope with or deal with or handle. And sometimes they are unable to do so, therefore giving rise to those um, statistical results that we mentioned earlier, increasing unhappiness, instability, greater likelihood of divorce or separation. Anna Ibrahim, what would you add here? Yeah. In addition to the challenges you mentioned, you have these challenges of loyalty of the children. To which religion and to which parents? At times the parents struggle. And one takes precedence. And sometimes, sometimes you ended up having children who are less religious than their parents. They always have recurring issues like she mentioned when it comes to issue of identity, baptism, naming, festivals, dressing, and also sometimes the society help in either way, where the children always find a, a different environment outside than what they have inside. In a community where people discuss Islam, they go to mosque, they could see conflict in their home. They are not comfortable. So, time, so sometimes they become agnostics. And if they're lucky, one religion takes over. But generally they have confused identity. And sometimes it even gets to issue of trust. Don't trust these Muslims again. I've seen families where they become two parties. <laughs> you know, some are Muslim condemning and challenging the others, siding with the mother, some are Christians, you know, those kind of things. So these are very big issues that uh, intending couple need to look beyond, you know, why Islam permit it for reasons, but we should look beyond just uh, the love conquers everything and the reality. So the advices are, if Muslims must marry, number one, it is safer and better to marry within the same faith. Yes, mm. that's number one. But of course, if that's not possible, then they should come up with a very, you know, holistic way of coping with these challenges we have outlined. Number two, Muslim parents should open up to allow marriages for more races, nationals, and you know, tribes. Muslims from other, for other ethnic other races, groups. Yes. And yeah. yeah, because I've seen situations where the parents will prefer somebody from their own tribe, mm -hmm. even if he's not a Muslim. Mm -hmm. And this has given rise to challenges. Sometimes, however much you try to address these issues, like we said before, where Muslims are minority, you can't avoid it. Because it depends on whom you have access to. But Muslim leaders should be proactive in discussing premarital issues, bold enough in trying to get the right person for their spouses. You know, it's not out of place. There is this online halal matching now. I don't know to what extent that is working in Nigeria, but in some cases it is working fine. You know, religious leaders also should help existing marriages of interfaith. Yeah, because uh, I've seen situations where interfaith marriage lasted for 20, 25 years. But it still failed later on. One of the couple died, either the husband or the wife. If you're not careful, <laughs> one of them will go back to her former faith, particularly where the people from the other faith have not been nice to her. So religious leaders should be proactive and see how do they help. They also should build interfaith network and dialogues. If there is good understanding between imams and pastors, you know, and very sincere and frank on the way forward, maybe it will minimize some of these frictions. But honestly, as it is now, it is a potential problem we are already battling with in the society. I've seen situations where 
the lady was faithful, fine, but what you know sent her back to her former religion was how she was treated by the relatives of the husband when they died. So already the families of the religion of the of the wife or any either of the couple as she cited have some reservations for you marrying a different person. Try to build good relation, expand the relationship, try to look beyond your immediate uh, family system and your children now. Always think. Yeah, already the family of one of the couple are not happy. In some instances, both are having reservations. So look beyond how do you build better relation as a shock absorber in case you pass away. That will always do its own way. So that you know to a great extent, your children are in safer hand. And what I have seen help in another instance is, the lady trying to get some of her immediate sibling to her own faith, the new faith she adopted with the husband. Or the husband trying to build a safe haven, or let me say safe space now, for his family by making good, building good relationship with his own younger ones. Because most of the time these are areas of uh, challenges. And sometimes they lose all. The man dies, the lady takes away all the children. They have nothing to do with the relatives of the parents. Sometimes they might even be on the same religion. But the pain and the grudge that existed, okay, while the husband was alive, what do I mean to say? A man marries a Christian, the lady ended up accepting Islam, but she lost her relatives. Okay? That's why they need to continue building relationship and religious leaders to come in. But most importantly, we should be proactive and look beyond now. And honestly, like she says, statistics help. I wish we can have similar statistics in Nigeria. It will not be far from that. Mm. Because we can see existing examples and realities. Allah Allah. Thank you so much. I think, um, you know, uh, there is definitely a big challenge as you've mentioned, with interfaith relations. Um, we should not forget about the maqasid of the preservation of family uh, and to make sure where existing interfaith marriages exist, you know, where these are already in place, the need to see how to support them, uh, how not to add tension, uh, not to break marriages. It is halal. Uh, and even if it would be discouraged, once there's already a marriage, the need to see how to support these marriages, as difficult as they may be, they come with their own challenges. Um, you know, a trend I think that is now nearly impossible to reverse over the last 100 or 200 years, depending on the society, is we have moved away from arranged marriages to love marriages where you go and look for who you want to get married mm. to. Uh, whereas in the past, families or the extended family uh, played a more important role in helping select spouses. Um, what's interesting is if you Google divorce rates of arranged marriages, um, you find that the divorce rates of arranged marriages um, are not just much lower. They're about 4% compared to the divorce rates in marriages where people go and look for who they want to get married, mm -hmm. which are up to 40%. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, um, Throwing away the practice of arranged marriages, or I'm not talking of forced marriages, I'm talking of arranged marriages where the family plays a very active role, knowing your character, knowing your needs, knowing the kind of person you are, they help in choosing. Um, these have uh, much lower divorce rates, and if you look at countries that have the lowest divorce rates in the world, these are countries that have the highest amount of arranged marriages. Um, of course, some of those societies have other problems, uh, difficulty in getting divorced and all of that. But I think before we 
um, abdicate the responsibility of helping our children, uh, especially in societies where Muslims are minorities, especially in societies where um, it is getting more difficult to find good people. Um, it's getting very difficult for young people to find good people. Uh, parents and community need to play a more active role in creating opportunities, creating programs, creating platforms uh, mm -hmm. where we encourage uh, and not just leave young people to the fate of uh, love and hormones and uh, all that that leads to. I think you've touched a lot on this subject area. Um, uh, the what is permissible, what is prohibited, what scholars disagree on, uh, and the need for us to really not joke with uh, the issue of interfaith marriages, because once marriages break and there's children involved, um, we need to show rahmah uh, to children, we need to see how to prevent that harm, and if it is going to happen, how to minimize the harm to that vulnerable uh, demographic we call children. I'd like to thank you both for your contributions to this discussion. Jazakumullah khairan. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Mm -hmm.